Hello, fellow members of the American College of Mohs Surgery. Uh, I'm Sharif Ibrahim. I'm a Mohs surgeon uh, up in Rochester, New York. And it really is my pleasure to address you today on some of the recent advances from our friends at Castle Biosciences, particularly advances uh, in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma uh, regarding the role of gene expression profiling in the management of this disease that uh, we see on a daily basis. Our friends at Castle Biosciences have really been working diligently in providing us with a nice repertoire of tools to apply genetic testing to some of the common conditions that we see. And this was initially first uh, the decision DX melanoma test, followed by the uveal melanoma test, most recently squamous cell carcinoma test. And there is also something called the uh, diff DX melanoma, which is a pathology-based test that can help us with the diagnosis of the difficult to characterize melanocytic lesions in our pathology labs. Today, I really wanna focus on the gene expression profiling for squamous cell carcinoma. The Decision DX SCC, as it's called, is important to identify the risk of metastases in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma patients with one or more risk factors. Of course, this audience needs no introduction to squamous cell carcinoma, but we know that this is an emerging problem in the United States, and we're so used to as a group telling our patients that melanoma is the most lethal of skin cancers. Uh, however, it is expected that deaths from squamous cell carcinoma uh, will surpass that uh, of melanoma. Because cancer treatment plans and their outcomes are really guided by the risk for metastases, the ability to accurately predict which of the squamous cell carcinomas we see will go on to a poor outcome, regional or distant disease is really of the utmost importance. And unlike other types of cancer, such as melanoma, breast, and other cancers, we really have been lacking with the development of a personalized method to identify risk on an individual basis. Clinical pathologic factors alone are limited in their utility by their low positive predictive value. And really given the high number and overall incidence of squamous cell carcinoma and the relatively rare event for metastatic disease, we need to do better at predicting risk on an individualized level. When we look at the rates of regional or distant metastases in the general squamous cell population, we have a nice body of literature that reports uh, a varying degree of rates. And if we look at uh, reported rates or, uh, from these really salient seminal papers in our literature, we can see that it varies from as little as 1.5% in this paper to 13% in, in NCCN guidelines, but really somewhere in this 2 to 6% chance for metastases. And these uh, vary across cohorts and somewhere around that 6% metastatic risk for all comers with squamous cell carcinoma. When we look at staging methods that are currently available, we see listed here AJCC 7th edition, AJCC 8th edition, which of course is limited to tumors only of the head and neck. And I think in our society, the most widely utilized uh, staging system, the BWH or Brigham and Women's Hospital Staging System. So Brigham and Willi Women's derives a tumor stage based on the cumulative number of zero to four high-risk factors. Uh, those with T1 disease have no high-risk factors, T2A having one high-risk factor, T2B having two or three high-risk factors, and T3 having four high-risk factors or bone invasion. And we see what those defined high-risk factors are here. Uh, greater than or equal to two centimeters in diameter, poor differentiation, perineural invasion involving a nerve of caliber greater than or equal to 0.1 millimeters, and invasion beyond the subcutaneous fat. On the other hand, AJCC 8th edition defines tumor stage largely on size alone, and then as you get into the higher T stages, uh, a single high-risk factor, uh, automatically categorizes that as a T3 tumor, and T4s are those that invade bone or beyond. When we look at the ability of the current staging systems to identify patients who are at highest risk for metastasis, we see that staging alone fails to accurately predict this risk. We know that one in three patients with metastatic outcomes are, met, are misclassified as being low risk, 
and that three of four patients who are designated as being high risk for metastasis do not go on to have a metastatic event of either uh, local or uh, regional or distant disease. Thus, the utility of clinical pathologic risk factors alone is limited by their low positive predictive value. Shown here is this misclassification from seven leading studies in our field, including those who have developed the staging systems. These studies demonstrate that the rate of missed metastases and those patients who are called high risk but do not go on to metastasize, which are the left and right columns respectively. These are based on BWH staging, but similar rates are demonstrated with AJCC staging. The decision DX SCC test is a gene expression profiling test that predicts metastatic risk for squamous cell carcinoma patients with one or more risk factors. It is based on an independently validated cohort of 420 high-risk SCC patients who had three-year follow-up data. It then designates a class score to these patients, with class one being the lowest biological risk for metastasis, class 2A moderate, and class 2B having very high biological metastatic risk of greater than 50%. This is not meant to replace our traditional clinical pathologic staging system, but really is a nice way to complement these approaches in our risk assessment for our squamous cell carcinoma patient. These results can thus be used, then be used to inform management decisions within established clinical guidelines. In this slide here, we see the actual genes that are being interrogated, whether they are higher or lower, than uh, at baseline based on their function. So we see here that uh, there's gene regulation or expression family of genes, cancer critical signaling pathways, immune related pathways, apoptosis or cell cycle regulation, migration, adhesion or invasion, metabolism and keratinization. And so the decision DX SCC takes into account the differential expression of all of these genes to determine the class score. As far as indications for use, this is not a test that is meant to be indicated in every patient that we see with squamous cell carcinoma. It is meant and validated in patients with one or more of the following risk factors that you see here. And these are the traditional risk factors that we see and use in our staging system. So large tumor sizes, location in the H or M areas of the head, neck, hands, genital, feet, or pretibial surface, patient risk factors such as immunosuppression and so forth that you see below. We can differentiate these based on those that we see on histology such as perineural invasion, poorly differentiated histology, depth of invasion, aggressive histologic subtypes versus those that we see clinically based on history and physical exam of the patient. The way we define high risk for squamous cell carcinoma patients varies tremendously. If we cast a wider net, we can look at NCCN guidelines that really characterize patients as being high risk with as little as one high risk factor. If we look at the narrowest criteria on the smallest circle on the right there, we look at EWH T2B tumors having two to three of those high risk uh, criteria. And so really the goal of the CASEL gene expression profiling test is to cast as wide a net as possible and not miss those patients that are either um, under or over categorized as being low risk or high risk, but really capturing people based on the lowest number of high risk features, even as little as one high risk feature. And so by casting the net as widely as possible, using those NCCN high risk criteria or most appropriate use criteria, we really hope to miss as few uh, as the, of those truly high risk patients as possible, and also not over treating those patients that are considered to be high risk based on staging criteria that really are, are at low risk for metastasis. So really how you use the test is up to you, but it is meant and indicated and developed and validated in those patients that have as little as one high risk factor. Let's look at some clinical evidence for the utility of the Decision DX SCC test. The test is developed and validated in a population of squamous cell carcinoma patients with as little as one risk factor. 
Uh, they then undergo the gene expression profiling, looking at the 40 genes that we mentioned previously from primary tumors. So this is from the punch or shave biopsy from the general dermatologist. It then applies the validated neural network algorithm and identifies the uh, tumor as being low, moderate, or high biological risk for metastasis. And again, that corresponds to class 1, class 2A, or class 2B, respectively. The test then accurately stratifies the patients based on their three-year risk for nodal or distant metastasis. And here we see the Kaplan-Meier curve looking at those rates of metastasis over five years, metastasis-free survival you can see there on the y-axis and years on the x-axis. And this is the entire 420 cohort that was used for validation of the test. We can see that pre-test, meaning without the GEP test, used at all, the overall cohort had a known metastatic rate of 15%. So it was really enriched for patients with known events. We see that those patients who were classified as class one GEP score had an overall event rate of just over 6%. So less than half of the overall population. Uh, and on the flip side, those with class 2B had a whopping 52% chance for metastatic risk. In this uh, slide, we look at individual risk factors plotted by both univariate and multivariate analysis. And we can see that a CASEL class 2A score remains a statistically significant predictor of metastatic risk with a hazard ratio that is similar that to traditional clinical pathologic risk factors, such as poor differentiation or perineural invasion. When we add a class 2B result to the same plot, we see a univariate hazard ratio of 11.6. So that is three times that of the strongest prognostic, prognostic risk factors. And that remains statistically significant in the multivariate analysis and is three times higher than that of the next hazard ratio in this cohort. So what that's saying is that a class 2B GEP result is extremely more predictive than the highest clinical pathologic staging factors alone. When we substratify the validation cohort based on the number of risk factors that the patient has, we see that the pattern remains just as strong. And so on the left here is the same plot that I showed you previously. In the middle here, we see patients with just one high risk clinical, uh, one high risk factor. And on the right here, we see a subset of patients with two or more high risk factors. On the bottom line here, we can see that as we increase the number of risk factors, we do see a higher overall event rate in that population. What we see here in the pre-test overall event rate, here's that 15% that we mentioned earlier. So a cohort that is really enriched for metastatic events. With just one risk factor, of course, we see that those are the patients within the overall cohort that have the lowest risk. That drops to about 8%. And as expected, those patients with two or more risk factors have a higher uh, risk for metastasis at almost 20%. However, when they undergo gene expression profile testing, we see a very similar pattern regardless of the number of risk factors that the patients have. So taking this most high-risk group with a 20% pre-test overall metastatic rate, we see that a class 1 GEP score drops that overall event rate to less than half at 9%. And across the board, that 50 to 60% metastatic rate for those class 2B patients. So very, very powerful data that we see here and that is consistent across all subsets with varying numbers of risk factors. When we look at Kaplan-Meier analysis for metastasis-free survival based on the newly revised NCCN guidelines that were just released earlier this year, we can separate the overall cohort into the high-risk NCCN cohort and the very high-risk NCCN cohort, and we see a very similar pattern of a class one event rate of 4% in high-risk, 11.9% uh, in the very high-risk, and a 60% in the class 2B for the class 2B patients 
that fall within that NCCN very high risk cohort. So we see that the very high risk cases demonstrate lower metastasis free survival than the high risk cases and that the 40 GEP test then further stratifies this risk based upon high risk or very high risk. So it's nice to see that this is consistent across the newest NCCN guidelines. When we look at univariate and multivariate analysis within uh, and across the different staging systems, so on the left, we see the NCCN risk group, whether they're high risk or very high risk. On the right, we see uh, GEP class score as compared to BWH low stage or high stage, we see a statistically significant predictive value and hazard ratio for a class 2A and class 2B as compared to very high risk NCCN patients alone. So just being very high risk by NCCN guidelines gives you a 2.54 hazard ratio by univariate and about two by multivariate. If you have a class 2B result, that drop, uh, increases to an 11.6 hazard ratio. And we see a very similar situation when compared to BWH staging. So we can see that a BWH high T stage uh, is a, does a little bit better than NCCN very high risk uh, grade. However, it's really nothing when compared to the class 2B CASEL result. This is my favorite slide in the data that I'm presenting to you today because it really gives you a nice visual demonstration of how risk, is, risk for metastasis is changed based on GEP class score. On the left, we see BWH staging. On the right, we see AJCC8 staging divided into those that are low risk and high risk. The black dots represent staging uh, of the, based on the clinical pathologic staging systems alone. The red is a class 2B CASEL result. The blue arrows are class 2A CASEL results and the green are class one. So take a patient of BWH T2B has about a 30 to 35% risk for metastasis. And that's very difficult. What do we do with those patients, right? Do we send them for imaging? Do we send them on for radiation or other adjuvant treatment? Do we change the intensity of our surveillance? Uh, it's, it's hard to determine. But if you then um, have those patients undergo GEP testing, and the majority of these patients will come back as class one, that drops that, that risk for metastasis to about half or less than half. Again, if they come back with a class 2B result, that might make your decision quite a bit easier because then they're taking uh, a presenting with a risk of over 70% metastatic rate. And if you look at uh, AJCC8 guidelines, that is more than 83% chance for metastasis. We have some really exciting data because we're, we're using this test, right? There are many of us uh, that are listening to this call and attending this meeting are using this regularly in our practice. And this is the clinical testing results of real world patients. This is not ba based on the validation cohort uh, or any retrospective data. These are actual tests that are coming in for clinical use uh, in, in real world patients uh, based uh, since the uh, initial uh, approval of the test last September. We can see here a, a histogram looking at the risk factor count per case submitted for GEP testing. And that most tested patients had greater than three risk factors. And so most of the, the tumors are located on the, um, on the head or within the H zone of the face. Most of them are large or almost half of them are large and a large number of them are rapidly growing. And you can see the other risk factors here. But we do see that most tested patients had greater than uh, three risk factors when submitted to GEP testing. And so we see that this is not really an overutilized test by any means. When we look at the number of tests that were submitted for GEP, uh, GEP score based on NCCN high or very high risk uh, group or BWH staging, we can see that some of these were BWH T1, but that 65% of these were either T2, T2A or T2B. And that the majority of these tests of the first thousand tests, about 70% of those had a class one result. And so that's taking tumors that are very high risk. So 43% that are NCCN very high risk 
or 65% that are T2A or T2B by BWH staging and reducing that risk for metastasis significantly to potentially under 10%. So taking these tumors that, based, that are based on clinical pathologic staging alone are extremely high risk for metastasis and really dropping that. And that gives us a little bit of breathing room. And on the flip side, if it does return with a class 2B result, then perhaps we'll uh, intensify either our treatment or surveillance of these patients. We can look at some uh, study cases of, of real patients where the GEP test was applied. And I think this is really telling. So in case one here, we see a 65-year-old male with a very typical squamous cell carcinoma that we see in our MOS practices every day, about 1.3 centimeters on the left uh, temple. It had been treated previously with cryo, but the patient is a kidney liver transplant patient. So just based on the patient's own uh, history, uh, this is a high-risk tumor. The patient had four stages of Mohs surgery. Uh, the margins were negative, but there was a, a small focus of squamous cell carcinoma noted on, on, on analysis, and it was poorly differentiated on histology. But there we can see nice uh, Mohs uh, removal and a linear repair. The patient then went on for uh, GEP testing and came back as a low risk or class one tumor. So here's a patient that had multiple high risk features, transplant patient, larger tumor located on the temple, four stages of MOS that were poorly differentiated, but giving us a class one result, we can see that the patient uh, was then reassured and further treatment was, uh, wasn't needed and the patient did well. Look at this tumor, very similar, all right? So uh, about the same size, located in the identical location, uh, another elderly white male with a two month history of a, a quickly growing lesion. Patient was treated in two stages. There was no residual tumor, but the tumor was poorly differentiated. And so we can see based on location and poorly differentiated histology, we could categorize this as being a high-risk tumor. This patient then presented with uh, intransit metastases uh, and local recurrence. This was a patient that was categorized as being class 2B. And this was a patient that was in the original study. So this was not a real world patient. But had this patient undergone high uh, GEP testing and was deemed to be a class 2B high risk patient, perhaps he may have gone on to adjuvant treatment or closer follow up, and either the metastasis would have been present, prevented or picked up on earlier. So I think these two back to back cases are really telling in that clinical pathologic prediction of metastasis can only take us so far because they do cast such a wide net. And that net can really be further refined by the use of GEP testing. This is just a comparison here of showing you between the two, two, pa uh, two patients, both transplant patients, almost the identical tumor in the identical location. However, a very different CASEL score. And when one went on to regional and distant metastasis and the other had a good outcome. So how do we integrate this, right? So the data looks great. We're very early. And of course, as a society, I think we're very uh, hesitant and skeptical on, on integrating new things into management. And I don't think those of us that are uh, using this or those, of, uh, those uh, at Castle are suggesting that we in any way change our standard of care. We do need a little bit of guidance on how we can best incorporate the GEP test for our squamous cell carcinoma patients. So after its launch in September of last year, we could see that uh, many of us are starting to integrate this test into our day-to-day -day practice. But there is still some questions. Which patients do we send for GEP testing? When do we do the testing? And so there is an upcoming supplement in the Journal of Drugs and Dermatology, wherein an expert panel was convened earlier this year to just talk about ideas, right? This is not changing the standard of care. These are just things uh, to contemplate and perhaps some very light suggestions on how we can incorporate the test in our day-to-day -day management of cutaneous SCC. And really the purpose is stated in this slide is to just to provide an early framework for those of us who treat the disease and are interested in, uh, in integrating the GEP assay into our day-to-day -day management. So I would uh, recommend that you can pick up a copy uh, of this supplement and, and that you might find that very informative. The findings of the panel included, included uh, 
input from most surgeons as well as surgical oncologists and radi radiation oncologists from both academic and community medical centers. So it really got the opinions from a variety of different specialists within a variety of different practice settings. And we use treatment guidelines within the, within the established staging systems and based on expert published, previous published expert recommendations and studies. The panel then focused on the decision-making points where information from the GEP test might inform the clinical management of patients with high-risk squamous cell carcinoma. And these decision points included nodal evaluation, whether by imaging or send a lymph node biopsy, the decision when and whether to use adjuvant radiation uh, therapy, as well as the intensity of follow-up and surveillance. And so uh, these were really light guidelines, again, not meant to change the standard of care, but just meant as a framework on where to incorporate the test within our management and treatment decision branch points. When we think about nodal evaluation uh, for our squamous cell carcinoma patients, this is most commonly done by imaging, and there are a few centers that do incorporate the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy to assay the regional lymph nodes for potential uh, metastasis. And so existing recommendations propose using baseline imaging, whether CAT scan or PET scan, in patients with BWH T2B or higher, where the risk of metastasis is greater than 20%. When using GEP to consider the same branch point, the expert panel said to consider using radiologic imaging to check regional lymph nodes and potentially distant organs for metastasis in patients with a class 2A or class 2B GEP test result. And so we know that the class 2A is about the same risk factors as some of the higher um, BWH staging, but the class 2B GEP result is significantly higher. And so again, the expert panel recommended nodal evaluation either by imaging or send a lymph node biopsy when a GEP test result was either class 2A or class 2B. When it comes to the use of adjuvant radiation therapy, I think we would all agree that the jury is still out on which are the appropriate patients to use and when to use uh, this, this treatment. When we are thinking about traditional clinical pathologic risk factors, the existing guidelines recommend adjuvant radiation therapy for squamous cell carcinoma patients with AJCCT4 staging, extensive perineural invasion, positive tissue margins, or after lymphadenectomy in patients who have already experienced metastasis to the regional lymph nodes. When considering how GEP test results may impact the same decision, um, there may be potential applications for Decision DX SCC in informing uh, the use of adjuvant radiation. And thus, we could consider referral to a radiation oncologist for at least a discussion of adjuvant radiation in those patients with a class 2A or class 2B result, or in patients with a very high BWH t tumor stage with a class 1 GEP test result. When it comes to the intensity uh, of follow-up and surveillance, we do see that uh, clinical follow-up alone is usually um, sufficient for those patients with low metastatic risk, so a less than 20% chance based on staging. Perhaps we might consider a nodal ultrasound or CAT scan and just seeing those patients once a year, or maybe once or twice a year in that intermediate group and at higher intensity, certainly doing some form of imaging and higher frequency of follow-up based on a 50 or greater than 50% metastatic risk based on staging alone. I think we see a similar pattern for all of these decision um, branch points. Uh, when we look at GEP test result, class one, uh, clinical follow-up alone might be sufficient. And this is going to be great for those patients that we see with multiple high risk factors where we really have a head scratcher saying, you know, what do we do with these patients? By getting a class one result, it might give us a little bit more breathing room and feel comfortable just following these patients clinically. Whereas those patients with a class 2A or class 2B result, in my practice, now I'm considering getting imaging for these patients uh, perhaps even if they only had one risk factor, but having a higher GDP class then does, of course, uh, come with a higher risk for metastatic disease. 
Of course, we don't really have enough data on the use of systemic therapy, whether it be immunotherapy or traditional chemotherapy. So the expert panel decided not to examine GEP test results to inform the use of systemic therapy at this time. However, it is really an exciting um, point where we can devise clinical trials to see that perhaps if earlier intervention with things like immunotherapy and the recently approved PD-1 inhibitors, uh, using them at an earlier point in these patients with very high risk for metastatic disease may potentially prevent the appearance of metastases down the road. So this is really uh, an exciting takeoff point for the design of future clinical studies to come. In summary, this is really an exciting time in the management of high-risk squamous cell carcinoma patients. We have come a long way with clinical pathologic risk factor assessment. However, they tend to either over, uh, overestimate risk in those high-risk patients and underestimate risk in those patients that may have as little as one high-risk factor. So GEP testing really allows us to interrogate biologic risk of individualized tumors and provide personalized care for our patients. This could then lead to really the reduction of unnecessary treatment and intensity of surveillance in those patients who are deemed low risk by GEP testing, and really the opposite, increased treatment intensity or follow-up and referral to our, our other uh, specialties that we work with, such as medical oncology, surgical oncology, and radiation oncology in those patients who have a very high GEP risk and thus high risk for metastatic spread. And the earlier we order this test in the management of these patients at the earlier branch points, the better, so that these other medical specialties can have this information when they're making their treatment decisions. And so for me personally, this is very exciting. I see it really as a um, something that we're going to be using uh, more and more in our practice, talking more and more about at our meetings to come, and really uh, a takeoff point for the design of, of, of clinical studies to see if earlier intervent intervention from these patients can improve survival over time. Thank you for your attention today, and I think we have a live question and answer session. I'm happy to uh, take any of your questions. Thank you.